Greetings, dear listeners. This is Jonah Goldberg, host of the Remnant Podcast, brought to you by the Dispatch and Dispatch Media. Very excited to have a return guest, literally not figuratively, the most cited legal scholar in um, the known universe. Sorry, I just saw Dune last night, so some of these phrases are going to keep popping up. He's a professor at Harvard Law School. He served in the White House in the Obama administration. He ran the Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs. He's written a bunch of books. He's been on here before to talk about some of those others book, other books. He's a fellow dog lover. He's got a new book, Look Again, The Power of Noticing What Was Always There with his co-author, Tali Sharot. Cass Sunstein, welcome back to The Remnant. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So the um, first rule in this podcast when we have authors with new books is to ask them the question I always want to get when I'm on a book tour. What's your book about? It's about um, the phenomenon of habituation. And before you fall asleep, let me explain it. You go swimming in the ocean, and in the first moment, it's really cold. And you think, how can I stand it? Why did my friend ask me to join in the ocean? And then after a while, you desensitize to the coldness of the ocean, and it's just great. This is true for a hot bath. It's true for um, living amidst crime. It's true for marriages where the fire goes out. It's true for living in a place that's nice that you end up thinking is gray, even though it's full of color. It's true for living with authoritarianism. It's built into all living creatures, including our beloved dogs and horses and unicellular bacteria. One of the things you talk about in the book, uh, we, we we booked this, you told me the book was coming out like a month ago and I screwed up and not getting on the calendar. And then I realized that and I apologized. And he said, how about tomorrow? So we're here. Um, but I've been looking at it uh, all this morning and yesterday and because I didn't realize I had had it, a copy of it. And um, Julia Child is one of the heroes of the book, who I, which I kind of think is awesome. And, um, or one of the characters, I should say, in the book. Julia Child is a hero of some books, but Julia Roberts is a hero of this one. Oh, what did I say? I'm sorry. Julia Roberts. I don't know how I did that. It, it's it's early. Uh, Julia Roberts is a character in the book. And um, why don't you sort of explain that? Because I want it gets to something I want to sort of talk about. Okay. So Julia Roberts was asked not long ago, what's a perfect day for you in an interview? She said, I wake up, I make breakfast for my kids. I get them ready for school. I go off. Um, then I start thinking about having lunch with my husband. We do that, then it's time to get the kids up from school. And then she cuts herself off and she says, it's boring. She says then after that, uh, because of my job, I go away for weeks. I have to go away for weeks to do movies and TV. And when I come back, it's surrounded by pixie dust. It resparkles. And so Julia Roberts is a hero of the book because she's alert to the fact that a routine that's amazing, you get children, you get a spouse you like, you get a place to live you like, that a routine becomes boring and not noticed if you don't go away and take breaks. But because she takes breaks, it resparkles. So the idea of resparkling, especially for good things, but also in its own way for not good things, is what uh, we urge America needs now. Yeah, so the reason why I like that is, I'm sure you're familiar with it and probably read it. Yuval Hariri, his book, um, uh, Sapiens, made a big splash. There was a lot in that book I really liked. There was a lot of it I was, I kind of tilted my head at and said, I want to put a pin in this and do my own research on. Um, but uh, one of the points he made, which always stuck with me, was that the notion of a vacation being rejuvenating is a very romantic and very modern notion that would have seemed bizarre to most human beings for most of human history. I thought the insight was correct. Historically, that has to be correct. And, but it also sort of bothered me. And that this, this Julia Roberts part made me realize that it's that we're looking at it from the wrong angle. It's not that the trip was rejuvenating. It's the return that's rejuvenating. And, and that is definitely true. I mean, uh, you know, distance makes the heart grow fonder um, is a real human thing. Completely. So the, um, the moment that got one part of the book going was I was at a wedding and probably at a dinner with Esther Perel. Um, and Esther Perel writes about marriages that go 
uh, not quite dark, but gray. And then what do you do about that? And so her presence at a wedding, she's a lovely person. It's a little ominous. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, but there she was at the wedding and she's, you know, she's a leading expert on habituation within marriage, where that means desensitization. And uh, it, the idea of heart, absent makes the heart go fonder is connected with what she talks about, which is a general phenomenon. My co-authors are neuroscientists, uh, which is fire needs air. Mm -hmm. So if your partner is amazing and you spend every second with them, there's no air and it, the, the fire goes out. That's what her finding is. And that's a specific case of habituation where you, you know, if you don't go on a vacation, then the fact that you get to live in a pretty nice place or you get a job that feeds you and that you enjoy some of the time, that's amazing. And to go back to your job and think, I get to do this for a living, even if it's not incredible, but it's something that has great moments in it or good moments or friends in it, that uh, resparkling happens. And it's just the fact that if you look at... Uh, uh, a, a cloud of colors and if you look at some something in the center of the cloud of colors where you stare uh eventually you're not going to see the colors anymore it's all going to turn gray this was discovered a while ago about how the eye works and that's uh connected with desensitization and which comes from repeated exposure you're not a full-on evolutionary psychology explains everything guy but you also don't sort of dismiss evolutionary psychology as part of the formula. Why did we evolve this? I mean, it, I can see it being not necessarily an ev evolutionary advantage in every circumstance. Okay, well, people with schizophrenia don't habituate so much that if you have a noise that is in a background in a room, or if you do something startling, people who don't have schizophrenia will on average reduce their uh, sensitivity to it, get used to it, they will habituate. People with schizophrenia don't. In fact, a defining characteristic we discovered of mental illnesses of multiple kinds is that people don't habituate. People who suffer from depression, if they get a setback, uh, they will keep thinking about it. And that keeping thinking about the setback is kind of depressing, whereas people who aren't depressed will get jolted by the bad thing and then they'll habituate to it, which is a signal of an answer to your question. If we had a species and we could imagine a science fiction story, people who didn't habituate, where they go in the water, it's cold, it stays cold, they mm -hmm. um, experience something, you know, there's uh, a loud noise and they keep hearing it as loud, or there's a background noise and they can't get it out of their head. Uh, the human species, and this is true for other species also, need to be alert to the surprise signal. So if there's a surprise signal, that is someone comes in to your room right now who's really different looking from anyone you expect to come in, you're completely on the alert, and that's good. If someone comes in the room who's very familiar to you, comes in the room all the time, uh, you've habituated to that, there's no surprise signal. So the idea that change and surprise jolt the mind uh, ensures conservation of scarce mental resources mm -hmm. for the things that need attention. To the evolutionary point, if an attractive mate passes by whom you've never seen before, uh, for the mind to be on the alert is evolutionarily good, more offspring, or if uh, a lion or tiger comes by, to be thinking, run is a mm -hmm. good idea, unless it's a lion or tiger with whom you've made friends. <laughs> case you can think oh that's that line i'm okay yeah although that can steer you wrong i mean like have you ever seen grizzly man uh it, it, it's it's disturbing um uh, about a guy who lived with grizzly bears in alaska my wife who's from alaska her family they have nothing but contempt for this guy because the the rule about grizzly bears is is they don't bother you until they bother you <laughs> and habituating yourself to being around them when they're well fed and not bothering you um, is a great way to have a grizzly bear eventually eat your face. And um, so you can see how like, uh, I mean, that's the, that's the, you know, that's the problem of sort of like winner's bias kind of thing where you, 
this worked for me once, so obviously this works. I mean, I think one of the reasons we have Donald Trump is that he violated all sorts of norms. It worked for him, so he took the lesson. I can do it again and again and again, and it, now it's become habituated into him. So it's, it's, it can cut both ways, but like, that's true of a lot of evolutionary stuff. Yeah, your point about bears is profound, uh, if I may say, because we thought of doing the book as a, a poem on behalf of habituation. Mm-hmm. But the more we got into the topic, the more we were alarmed by what habituation does. Uh, people sometimes take risks, economic and health risks, because they've habituated to the thing that hasn't bitten them, so to speak. Mm-hmm. And that means that gambling will go on in one or another form. Take gambling as a general idea, not about poker. Mm-hmm. And, and they they get poor, they get dead. So risk habituation is a big problem. Yeah. I mean, the actually, the example I use with my own daughter and with friends of mine is drunk driving, is that if you're absolutely terrified of having an accident and you've been drinking too much, I mean, if you're blotto, that's a different thing. But if you've had a couple, one or two drinks too many, and you're really scared about getting into an accident, you'll probably get home because you're going to be hyper attentive and you're aware of the problem. It's when you say, well, that worked. So you do it again and again until you think, well, I can, I'm just one of these guys who can drive after drinking. And that's when you wrap yourself around a telephone pole. Completely. So there's a chapter of the book. It wasn't a terrible when authors start sentences by saying there's a chapter of the book. that's kind of unforgivable, but I've habituated to it. This you're you're forgiven. I've, I, I've had a lot of authors on here. I've habituated to it as well. <laughs> Forgive me, audience. Uh, so let's discuss the substance rather than the fact that there's a chapter in the book, mm-hmm. this, and the, it's about risk habituation. So often construction workers are most at risk toward the end of the construction work. And that's really surprising because you think by the end of the construction work, they completely know what they do, they're doing and they're safe. It's the opposite. They, they know what they're doing and they're habituated to the risks. And just as you say, they're not on guard. Uh, my dog is right now scratching. I was I was asking if that's a dog. That sounds like a dog. So. Then they quiet down a little bit. <laughs> um, and then it's also the case that um, when Sweden switched its rule from driving on one side of the road to driving on the other side of the road, uh, it was generally believed we we're going to have a lot of crashes because mm-hmm. to drive on the other side of the road is unfamiliar and backwards and scary. But the opposite happened. There was a very significant reduction in accidents in the period after Sweden switched from driving on one side to the other. And it's just as you say, that once people flipped the side on which they were driving, they were scared and they were super careful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's that's I never heard that example. That's a good one. Uh, we're going to get to the social media and politics stuff, but I figure we'll save the, that for dessert towards the end. As we were sort of discussing briefly before uh, we got started, I'm a conservative. You're not. But we're the Venn diagram of our views overlaps a lot on sort of like Hayekian liberalism and that kind of th- stuff. And my view has always been a conservatism that doesn't conserve classical liberalism isn't worth conserving. But at the same time, conservatism isn't just classical liberalism. And one of the things that conservatism is, is in part a respect for, let's call it positive habituation that we just get used to certain precepts, taboos, mores, dogmas, whatever, um, and they become, I can't remember the political scientist who coined the phrase, but habits of the heart, right? And that, that, that culture and tradition have an innate value, and I can make the Hayekian case for it because most traditions have a lot of trial and error built into them. These are best practices developed over time. Um, sometimes they go wrong and traditions have to be overthrown, but you should view every tradition like Chesterton's fence. Know why the tradition exists before you get rid of it. So is there are there good kinds of habituation that that you think people should be cognizant of as well? That's a fantastic point. And uh, let's talk about um, about habits and habituation. So there may be a habit of courtesy, of considerateness of respect for, let's say, property rights or um, contract rights that is ingrained and that outruns law. So there be norms that you don't lie, you don't breach your contract, and that those are 
habits of the heart, as you say. That's really important. And I think also, as you say, there might be some norms that are built up over time that need to be reassessed. Uh, there may be a norm of racial segregation, for example, that's also instantiated in a law that needs to be reassessed. But there's that point. Habituation is decreasing sensitivity to stimuli. So let's uh, put that in bold letters and cry it from the rooftops. Mm -hmm decreasing sensitivity to stimuli. So if you are in a place where there's, let's say, dirty air, you will get used to the dirty air. I was in Beijing a while ago, and my first day there, I couldn't believe how polluted the air was. And I was stunned that people there weren't, you know, coughing and shocked, but of course that's what they lived with. People who live with a lack of freedom uh, don't count freedom as a very important ingredient of well-being. People who lack health care in a nation don't consider access to good health care an important aspect of well-being. And that's because they've habituated respectively to a lack of freedom and to diminished health care. So what I'm pondering is what's the relationship between good habits of the heart and habituation? It's not like one-on-one, because -on -one, mm -hmm. if you have a habit of, um, let's say, considerateness to others, uh, it's not like you've diminished sensitivity necessarily to anything, though it is the case that you will be maybe uh, um, calm rather than super grateful when you see considerateness on the part of others you think that's how people are so in that sense you're taking for granted something that's a, a terrific human achievement so I, th I think what we want to say is that uh diminished okay so the, re the reason we did forgive the words the book is that the, the question of habituation is one that there is no book about mm -hmm. even though it's incredibly fundamental so if you see, you know, people living uh, with something spectacular that they don't much appreciate, they like, they're habituated to it. The fact that on a vacation, the peak moment is 43 hours in to mm -hmm. a tropical vacation. If you ask when are people happiest, 43 hours in. Uh, the first day is really good, but people are getting used to it. After 43 hours in, people are starting to habituate and they don't love it so much. They like it. They might even love it, but not as much. Mm -hmm. And if you ask people, when do they like best their vacation? What was the best part? There's one word that dominates people's answers and it begins with F and it's first. So the first time I saw the beach, the first time I landed and saw the mm -hmm. sun sky the first time I saw the hotel. And that's profoundly instructive about habituation. When one's having a very good experience, like listening to a piece of music or getting a massage, if you like that, uh, people asked, do you want to hear it all the way through or do you want to have the massage for an hour or do you want to be broken up into stages? People say, I want to hear the music all the way through. I want the massage completely right now, all of it. But people have better experiences if it's broken up. And that's because if you're listening to some music that you really like, please let it be Bob Dylan, or please let it be Taylor Swift, if not Bob Dylan. Uh, if it's broken up, then you dishabituate, and you have the experience of seeing it anew-ish mm -hmm. of the 10-minute break. And that's why breaking up good experiences is, is a really good idea. And uh, motoring through bad experiences, like cleaning up a messy room or doing some tasks you don't like, to motor through is a good idea not to break it up. And that's because people habituate to the bad thing and, and hate it less. Both of the things I just said, which is break up the good experience and motor through the bad, defy intuitions as mm -hmm. by poles. So that's why this is about habituation. And I think the relationship to the conservative thing is that people habituate to habits of the heart that are good 
which is pleasing because they continue with them. But we need like Hayek and Burke to remind us that these are achievements to be cherished rather than, you know, Thursday. There's a lot of self-help type stuff in this book about midlife and all these kinds of things. And I highly encourage people to go out and get it. But I, I want to play with this theme for a second here um, without unfairly giving short shrift to that stuff. Is it possible? So I wrote a book called Suicide of the West. And part of my argument is that liberal democratic capitalism, whether it's your kind or my kind, right, whether it's FDR kind um, or it's Milton Friedman kind, uh, which are both they're at the they're at the outskirts of different interpretations of liberal democratic capitalism, but they're both liberal democratic capitalism. And it's not only the best system ever conceived of for improving man's condition, you know, the relief of man's estate, as Francis Bacon would put it. Um, it's really the only successful anti-poverty program ever invented. And it's completely unnatural because if it were natural, it would have occurred a little earlier in the evolutionary record. And the problem with it is it doesn't feel like it. And, and the point of conservatism rightly understood, which is a point I originally got from Yuval Levin, is, um, is to show gratitude. Uh, gratitude opens your heart, makes you realize how lucky you are, right? Um, entitlement, resentment, these are the opposites of gratitude, and we teach those things to people every single day. I'm not doing this to plug my own book. The book came out five years ago. Who cares? The point I want to get at, though, is because it, it just occurred to me is maybe, you know, there are all these surveys that say that conservatives tend to be happier than liberals. Um, and there are all sorts of interesting theories. Some are just just so stories. Who knows, right? But it occurs to me that maybe one of the reasons why there's some truth to this is that there is something about the conservative temperament that embraces the tragic vision, that understands life is unfair, understands that humanity lived in terrible conditions for most of its time on this planet and therefore encourages a sense of gratitude for for even the stuff you've habituated to. And when you take everything for granted that you're just born into this incredibly prosperous universe that is 21st century America and you think this is the natural state of things and you get habituated to it that encourages a kind of resentment about well, I want more, right? You know, the Veruca Salt response to, you know, modern prosperity. And um, I'm just wondering, is there anything to, do you think there's anything to that? Or am I just uh, uh, running amok here? Let me, say, let me say something I believe to be true based on not quite data, but building out from data. Uh, why is gratitude um, a good thing to feel for the person who's feeling grateful? seems to have that effect there's mm -hmm. data consistent with that um it's not obvious but the theory that that my neuroscientist co-author and i have is that it dishabituates mm -hmm. you so if you are having a day let's say and it's kind of an okay day and at the end you're thinking uh, i'm grateful that i'm healthy that i have a dog that i have friends, that I have a job, then those things are no longer um, just furniture. They are gifts. And if you're in a room that has a noise, you'll habituate to it and not hear it, even if it's a mildly unpleasant noise. In fact, I'm hoping that some listeners are experiencing that because it would vindicate the thesis. I am, by the way. There's a a uh, 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 heater in the room. I don't need that heater on, so maybe I'll turn it off. <laughs> I didn't notice until I said this. So the gratitude, in a way, it makes you hear the noise, which is good mm -hmm. noise, that you would otherwise uh, not. So it's, it's an exercise in the creation of resparkling. In uh, thank you, Ms. Roberts. And so people, if conservatives are disproportionately are happier than liberals, let's say. And if conservatives are more grateful than liberals, then we have a mechanism by which that would be so. I, I, I want to, I have a, 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 a note on my office door that's a quotation from Daniel Kahneman that says, 
Uh, I don't know. It's not a matter of thinking. It's an empirical question. I don't have the evidence. So uh, I don't think that's the most charming thing to have on one's office door. <laughs> <laughs> The, what I want to know is if conservatives are happier than liberals, is, is that because they're conservatives? I mean, if you learn that people who fish are happier than people who don't fish, it might be because fishing makes people happy. It might be because there's some, something else. And to be clear, I don't even know if that data holds up anymore because most of the conservatives I know are so friggin' miserable these days um, to the point where I don't think they're particularly conservative, right? I mean, this is the problems that radicalism is the opposite of conservatism and there's a lot of inherent radicalism on the right these days and that... radicalism isn't um uh grateful right for sure so there it might be justified so you know i'm pro-american revolution and and it may be that dishabituation to a terrible situation in let's say russia is very agitating for the people who get dishabituated, but uh, but it might be warranted. Okay, so getting back to the book, I, and I reserve the right to circle back to some of these points as they process in my head. One of the points you make in the book is that habituation causes dishonesty to escalate. What do you mean by that? Okay, so here's the data. Um, uh, a bunch of people were taken by my co-author into a lab, not by kidnapping, by voluntary Hayekian interaction. Mm -hmm. Transactional contractual arrangement. Completely. And okay. they were paid, and they were told this is going to be an experiment where you can cooperate with a stranger and make some money if you successfully cooperate. And then a number of them are told once they get there, Actually, you can make more money if you lie. So if you lie to your uh, teammate, you'll make more money. And they're uh, connected as the experiment goes to something that keeps track of what's going in their brain. So this is a measuring what parts of their brain are doing what. It turns out a number of people do lie, and the amygdala in the brain, which is, registers strong emotions, is on fire. So people are lying and they are very uh, amygdala activated as they are doing it. The amygdala is sending out a big blaring siren. You're lying. As the experiment goes on and people keep lying and they uh, make more money, they lie more as it goes, uh, the amygdala gets quieter and quieter. Till the end of the day, the amygdala is not uh, blaring a siren anymore. It's just offering no resistance. Lie, 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 lie. Mm -hmm. So the data strongly suggests that people habituate to their own lying. Not to lying by others, though that also happens, and we can discuss that. But people's own immoral conduct becomes less neurologically alarming the more they do it. It's a little like going into cold water. So this shows the generality of the phenomenon of habituation. I knew a guy a number of years ago who cheated on his taxes like every year. And I was shocked that he would tell me that he, how he cheated and that he had cheated. And what shocked me more than the fact that he was cheating was that he was so open and relaxed about it. Yeah, that was admitting it. Yeah, without any sense of there was a thing there. So mm -hmm. it was like the uh, people in our experiment who whose amygdala completely quieted down. And if you see people in business or politics who lie a lot, some of them are uh, on trial, um, surely something like this happened where initial lies um, uh, were concerning unless there's you know, sociopaths or something, but that they got used to them and ceased to um, be alarmed by their own misconduct because that's what they do. Yeah, not to drag in things closer to home for you, but like uh, with recent troubles at Harvard, but like um, this is part of my theory about plagiarism is that a lot of plagiarists, they really are really anguish, anguished about it the first time and then they don't get caught. And then they don't get caught again until then it becomes habituated and like they, they don't even, some of them I don't think even realize they're doing it. 
And at, by, the, by the time they do get caught, and then there's just this terrible record of it, right? And well, I love that example. Let's underline it. So repeated plagiarism, and you've explained something to me, which I didn't get until you explained it, because I didn't connect it to uh, the book. But if you plagiarize a lot, it's baffling. How can someone do that? Yeah. I mean, to do it once is maybe they had a bad day or they were something went wrong. But to do it repeatedly, I think your explanation is completely right that uh, not only did they not get caught, but their own uh, internal siren went quiet. Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, it's sort of like I always tell people, the easiest potato chip to say no to is the first one. <laughs> um, but uh, you said somebody in the study about how their amygdala goes quiet about their own lying, but not about the lying of others. And I would have assumed that part of the problem with the dishonesty escalation is the habituation to other people's lying or other norm violations. Does that not happen? No, it, it completely does happen. It's just this wasn't an experiment that tested that. Okay. So it completely happens. The percentage of Americans who say that uh, lying in a political context is okay is much higher now than it was in the relatively recent past. And that's clearly a result of habituation. So you what uh, you take as morally acceptable depends on what's all around. So if you live in a political culture in which prominent officials are, are lying all the time, then that's what people do. And your own feeling, it's like our discussion of habits of the heart, the habits of the heart have been shifted and people lie. It's like in, in societies that have corruption, the corruption isn't thought to be abominable. It's thought, thought, and it's shocking for someone who lives in a society where corruption is rare to go into a place where you're supposed to, uh, you know, give a, give a bribe to someone to get them to do something. But but the, the amygdala is, is, isn't firing. And misinformation in the United States, I believe, consistent with the data and how the mind works, is intentional misinformation, let's call it, a.k.a. lying is much more tolerable now than it was in the recent past because it's widespread and people are habituated to it. So, um, and again, I didn't, I swear I didn't plan on trying to border collie herd you into conservative conclusions on some of this stuff, but I think it probably helps you to realize that a lot of the lessons in this book are trans ideological, but just to- this, this is, I should say, this is, isn't a book that is, uh, left of center or right of center. Yeah, no, it's not political. I'm not trying to say it is. And But one of the timeless conservative insights is that dogma is useful. And the point about some moral dogma is that sort of like, I, I think taboos are useful. I get very tired of the sort of quintessential old, you know, 19, late 90 or mid 2000s slate about why, oh, this taboo is silly because there are no victims here, or whatever. It's like, there are a lot of, there are a lot of potential downsides of the taboos. We just forgotten what, you know, what they are. And so taking things like lying seriously before it leads to, a, a, the, the, my point is, is that the norm violation stuff, you should take seriously when the stakes are low. Because the part of the problem, and I hate slippery slope arguments normally, but I, that's where I'm going with this, is that if you slowly habituate people to the idea that these norm violations can be forgiven, they stop being norms entirely. And that's a very small C conservative way of looking at the world is like these rules matter because they matter, even if I can't predict for you the consequences of violating them down the road. I completely agree. And I, I wouldn't have completely agreed before I started working on this topic. And let me give you an example of something that I used to think was really wrong, but I now think is really right. A philosopher named Bernard Williams uh, criticized utilitarianism thinking that, saying that if someone you love is about to get hit by a car and you just think before you uh, try to save them, whether the costs of saving them are lower than the benefits, you've had one thought too many. Mm -hmm. So this is a one thought too many objection to doing 
uh, a utilitarian calculus. So you just do what the norm requires, which is a conservative thought. It's the Kant, you know, whether mm -hmm. what his politics are, who knows, but it's a Kantian thought also. Um, I like that much more than I did for about 20 years. And it's that the one thought to many idea prevents you from habituating to doing a utilitarian calculus before, let's say, lying mm -hmm. or breaching a contract. And even if in particular cases, uh, that outfit doesn't make you look fat, that's an okay lie. Right. But even to um, lie a little bit, uh, habituates people to dishonesty or to whatever, and we need not to habituate to dishonesty or whatever. See, I like that. I'd, I'd never heard that the, the Williams thing. I, I think it's a very good point. I, what I keep going back to, and you're one of the few guys I can talk to about this, you know, there's all this talk in the economics world about Hayek versus Keynes. And that's interesting. It's a fun historical moment. The grap video is great. Fine. Whatever. The more interesting argument, at least figuratively, metaphorically, is between Hayek and John Dewey. Because John Dewey, it's a little unfair to him, but I think he's a good symbol of this, represented a school of thought of American pragmatism that says the individual mind can work out all the permutations on paper and make a rational cost-benefit analysis decision in every instance. And Hayek was like, no, no, no. You got to crowdsource a lot of these things. There's a reliance interest in certain neutral rules that even if they're arbitrary and could be better, the fact that they exist, I mean, like there's no, there's actually a reason why we have red lights and green lights. It's a very old story, but let's just say it's totally arbitrary. Once you get enough people believing that red means stop and green means go, changing it for some better color has a real cost to it. I mean, you know cost-benefit analysis better than the next 100 experts on it, so I'm not telling you anything you don't know. But this, this idea of, like, I've been saying during the troubles on the right for the last 10 years, I think a lot of the intellectual constructs for journalistic ethics and public intellectuals is angels on the head of the pin stuff that is solved by just simply saying, do not lie. Do not lie. Do not write things you do not believe to be true. Do not say things you do not believe to be true. And you'll be okay in every, because it's, it's an all-purpose ethic. It's an all-purpose moral rule. Even if it's going to be wrong in some circumstances, it's better if everybody follow it and that we get habituated to it. And, and that, it seems to me, is a, is a thing that has been lost. Right. So this is the, so I'm going to make a distinction, the, the, bright side of following habits, even if we don't know in particular cases that they're good. So it might be that breaching a norm in a particular case is in self-interest or is even socially good, but to have an alarm in the head is a good thing. Habituated means decreasing sensitivity to a stimulus. And if you, and, and so the way that would be specified here is if, as a journalist, one lies, uh, the amygdala isn't firing. And that's terrible because it will create a, uh, a green light for repeating it, as we observed among our experimental subjects. But so, so isn't part of the answer as a social norm, as a cultural norm, maybe not as a legal norm, because that gets complicated with free speech and whatnot, that the public reaction to norm violations needs to be harsher to create that, to, 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 to prevent the habituation to norm violation. Now, can I give you a personal example? This is a great topic. So, uh, I worked in the government, I've had three stints, and if anyone asks me what happened in the White House, I always say, I'm not gonna say. Mm -hmm. And it's a little rigid. So I was recently asked by someone who's doing an academic thing, asked me some questions about what happened under in the Obama administration, I wouldn't say, and that's because I never say. And if, is that right? It's not clear that it's right. Mm -hmm. But I do have, uh, I'm sure my amygdala is, uh, you know, uh, on uh, in some kind of 
horrific state when I started venturing the thought, but well, maybe I'll talk about some private conversation that happened. But my, but I won't do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'm, I'm wrong, maybe that's excessive, but it fits with your general point, which is to have an extreme reaction to a norm violation might be necessary and desirable so that people have a surprise signal in the head when the norm is violated. So this is, this is the, the, big, I, the big idea, at least one of the chapters of what might be a book, who knows, that uh, um, if people hear a surprise signal, then they're completely on the alert and they're in a state of dishabituation. If something is routinized, there's no surprise signal. So it's like that background noise that you don't hear, which is really good for many things. That's the direction you're going. And I agree with that. It's not good in circumstances in which people don't, uh, let's say, celebrate uh, democratic capitalism or in which they don't uh, express horror at, let's say, uh, fascism. Let's get to social media, because I think it's the thing that illuminates. I have follow-ups on this, but I think social media, the context of the problem of social media will provide useful hooks to get to some of the points I wanted to get, to, get at. So what the hell is going on on social media, and how does it relate to the book? Okay, so let's talk about falsehood. Um, why is it that falsehoods spread and are powerful on social media? There's something called the illusory truth effect, and let's illustrate it now, shall we? Uh, I don't know if you heard that Tom Brady just announced he's running for governor of Florida. I don't know if you heard that. That I've not heard that. His announcement that it was a surprise announcement, his announcement that he's running for governor of Florida was motivated by the fact that he has some mainstream conservative political convictions that he thinks are not expressed. And while he has no political experience, he's interested in running for governor. It's prompted by the fact that he's in the public domain and he's mm -hmm. got some. OK, so I just lied mm -hmm. it three times. You you, did, you knew I was lying. Yeah, I know. Because I know what this phenomenon is, but go on. Yeah, <laughs> I actually said three times that Tom Brady is running for governor. And the illusory truth effect is if you say something twice, then people tend to think it's true. And uh, I'm kind of starting to think myself, maybe Tom Brady, who I greatly admire, is running for governor. Should I give him money, even though I'm myself the one who made it up? Um, so the reason the illusory truth effect works is that if people hear something for the first time, there's a surprise signal in the mind. Uh, people aren't habituated to it. It's hard to process. And then people are on their guard about the possibility of falsehood. Once people hear something twice or more, it's really easy to process. And the way the brain works is easier, truthier. Mm -hmm. It's about habituation. If something is something you easily get, then you think, check, not necessarily that you're gonna believe you know, children, please don't listen to what I'm about to say. If you've heard that Santa Claus comes on Christmas, you might um, not believe that, even if you've heard it uh, 10,000 times. But if you've heard something, and this is the, one of the easiest things to demonstrate in the lab, it's just a very strong effect that if people hear things twice or more, they tend to believe it's true. Now, let's go to social media. If you hear a bunch of times something that's false, um, you can take your pick and maybe we can give an example. Um, people will believe it, mm -hmm. especially if they're inclined to believe it, they like believing it, or it fits with their prior convictions. But even if not, even if they're, you know, kind of have no emotional investment and they don't have any prior anything, hearing it three or four times, some part of them is going to say, oh, I, I've heard that before, it must be so, like vitamin C cures colds or uh, going out, you know, opening the window at night creates colds. I think both of those are false, but I've heard them several times, so I believe them to be true. Social media is an engine for belief in falsehood because the illusory truth effect is uh, given free reign. What are some other ways um, in which you can incept falsehoods into people's heads? Um, um, because it's not just repetition, right? And there are other 
rhetorical hooks that you can use, aren't there? Yeah, there's a, a, a great uh, Supreme Court advocate. I heard this very recently, Archibald Cox, who was prominent nationally for a time, who was before that a great lawyer, Supreme Court. And he was asked, why were you so good? And what, what was your secret? And he said, well, I, I figured out there's a simple rule. First, you have to get them to want to agree with you. Mm-hmm. Then you have to show them how. I think that's profound, and it's about convincing people of all things. First, you have to get to them to want to agree with you. Then you have to show them how. So, and notice the order in which Professor Cox mm-hmm. first get them to agree with you. So, a trick is if you can get people to want to agree with you, either by appealing to their sense of identity or to their sense of grievance, which is their present or to their sense of commonality with you, or to their sense of exclusion from others, uh, you can get them to want to agree with you. I'm hoping that I don't use this strategy, by the way. Um, uh, Often, if you want to convince someone of something to which they are not inclined, to start out by making common ground with them is really smart, because they're less likely to want not to agree with you because they think you're a friend or one of them. And then to show them how, meaning let's suppose you want to get uh, get them to agree that the United States shouldn't fund Ukraine anymore. Uh, To get them to want to agree with you by suggesting, you know, we're on the same team here or you're the sort of person who and then to show them how to do that by saying, you know, just take the money away from that and give it to something else. Mm-hmm. And then and you can specify the, th- the other thing. So the, 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 uh, I increasingly think that people, including in my fields, law and behavioral science, have somewhat underplayed the importance of affect in uh, social media and persuasion generally. Um, you know, take two people who were successful, Barack Obama and Donald Trump. They're both, have, they're very good with affect. That's a strength they both have. Uh, and you can specify they don't have the same affect, but they're, they're very, they're both funny. And, and that is part of their source of their success. The reason why I wanted to get into social media a little bit and about the dishonesty stuff is it seems to me that part of Donald Trump's genius, and I use that word very advisedly because I think it's a very lizard brain kind of genius, um, which makes some sense in the context of what we're talking about in that he spends his whole life basically operating like a condo salesman. What do I have to do to put you in this condo today? And then he would say say it whether it was true or not, right? Um, the The... Lots of people have made the point that part of that Trump's real superpower is shamelessness. Um, But I think that that's, and I think that's true, but I think that stems from something else. I think it stems from the fact that he is kind of representative of the larger problem that you're getting at about on social media, which is that in a time of more robust and healthy norms and positive habituation, let's just sort of stipulate what that that's that we had more of that at one point. There was a very strong distinction in the culture between negative attention and positive attention. Sometimes too strong, like too much stigma on certain things, too much scorn and, you know, scarlet letter type stuff. And we can agree to all that too, fine. But my point is, is that there was a real, it was seen that there was a real difference between negative attention and positive attention. The weird thing about Donald Trump is while he would still prefer positive attention, he would take negative attention over no attention 10 times a day, right? I mean, it's like that's, it, it, he ha- the attention is the important part. And part of the problem with the social media world that kids grow up in today is that simply the attention economy reduces this distinction between positive attention and negative attention to the point where the only thing that really matters is attention qua attention. and. I think that is like steroids for this habituation problem. Because what you're basically saying is any norm violation is fine as long as it gets clicks and likes and it gets people talking about you. 
And that way lies a kind of moral anarchy. That's fantastic. So uh, a number of years ago, I wrote a book called Democracy and the Problem of Free Speech. And it got a review, very negative in the Wall Street Journal, which had a great title, Foe of Free Speech Shoots Mouth Off. <laughs> great title. And it, um, my mother called me after it came out and said, congratulations, everyone's calling me that you got a review in Wall Street. Yeah. <laughs> it was a really negative review with a pretty savage title. <laughs> it was just what you said. The fact that there was a review, my name, Wall yeah. Street Journal, that was a great thing for my mother and her friends. Okay, there's that. Um, thinking as you as you talk, that note that um, uh, if people are habituated to something, there aren't colors, it's, it's gray. And uh, that's, they're not getting a surprise signal. So you're going about your life. And I think, did you tweet something or say something saying that people who are full of rage are often the problem is they're bored? Oh, I was going to get to that because there's a weird serendipity that we're doing this right after I wrote this thing about the problems of boredom. But yes, I did. That was me. So that I haven't read you yet, but I just thought I think that's fantastically interesting. And if if you are not getting a surprise signal, you're bored. And that's a problem that's connected with midlife crisis, by the way. Mm -hmm. Midlife crisis, we speculate, which is not quite all over the world, but in many countries, it's because if people are at a certain age, the likelihood that something, you know, that they're going to fall in love, they're going to learn something big, they're going to have a new job, that they're going to move someplace is, is close to zero, and then uh, they're in crisis. It's, 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 maybe it's like a depression. Okay. Uh, uh, whatever Trump is, he is not reluctant to give the surprise signal. Mm -hmm. So he does uh, cr create... Uh, in, in habituate people to certain things which formerly had been uh, shocking. But he also is giving the surprise signal a lot. He deploys it. And that uh, activates attention. Um, I think I'd, I'd add one point, which just occurred to me as you were talking. If there's a biography of Trump at some point uh, with the title Glee, G-L-E-E, -E, <laughs> Mm -hmm. That would be interesting because he does, sh not the TV show Glee, but... I was, it, I was wondering when you're going to get show tunes into this, but go on. Yeah. The dance with the singer. But he does have, I think, this isn't part of the book or this isn't empirical. I think he, he does have glee, meaning mm -hmm. a kind of uh, joy. The word joy is a little too... Um, I think too uh, sentimental, but mm -hmm. it's, the glee is better. He has a kind of glee at his own success, at the, the foibles or worse of others. The, there's a, a kind of uh, uh, desire to induce laughter. That's that's part of the surprise signal which he generates. I think you're right. The point that negative attention is seen by many as indistinguishable from positive attention. That's uh, deeply concerning and it has some truth. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I go back, um, I, I don't know where she is today or what she's doing now, but um, uh, it was a daughter of a famous actor. I'll just, in case she came to her senses, I don't want to like further her problems. But there was a daughter of a very famous actor who announced that she was going to go into pornography and which I don't think is a good decision. I'm, I'm a curmudgeon. Okay. Um, and the explanation that she gave in an interview always stuck with me is that she said, if you go up through the traditional route to be an actor, um, it takes too much time to get famous in effect. And, um, and you look at the, the various other celebrity people who, accidentally, and I'm using air quotes, release their porn tapes or their sex tapes. It's, it's a way to become famous much more quickly. And I think this desire for fame, which is sort of very close to what we're talking about here, is fame is amoral, right? There is no moral, you can be, you know, Gandhi and Mother Teresa are famous, and so are Hitler and Charles Manson. Um, uh, the distinction between famous and infamous is gone, right? There's just synonyms. And that's a 
we're becoming habituated, I think, societally to this idea that providing a, a kind of judgmental moral context to one's norm violations, because they're, po- as, you, as you know, like, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, huge norm violator in a lot of ways. Civil disobedience is a massive norm violator, but it's a good norm violator. It's a positive one. It is one that, you know, overturned a bad tradition, a bad norm. Um, but that doesn't mean all norm violations make you a rebel in the positive sense. And yet we live in a time where everyone wants to be transgressive. Everyone wants to be a rebel. Everyone wants to feel like um, they're heroic in a certain way. And that was sort of the point of my, my piece about boredom is that if you go back in time, you look at most revolutionaries, the vast majority of them come from fairly comfortable, not necessarily rich, but comfortable backgrounds, bourgeois backgrounds, maybe petit bourgeois. They're not lower class, working class. They're not peasants. There are very few peasant revolutionaries um, that don't get killed, essentially. I mean, there are some, but, and this is a point Schumpeter makes about how, you know, by the third generation after the titans of industry, you get these comfortable people who are now opposed to the very system that made their families rich in the first place. And I think boredom, which Heidegger writes a lot about, um, forces people. There's a lot of psychological, maybe your next book should be on boredom. Um, There's a lot of psychological literature that I was looking at to write the piece. People experience boredom as pain. And anything that, there are actually some studies where people will prefer to electroshock themselves rather than put up with the tedium of just sitting there with their own thoughts. And I think that there's, this is one of the problems you get with habituation is this desire for any stimuli, regardless of whether it's good stimuli or bad stimuli. I, I do have a book coming out. I'm ashamed to <laughs> become famous, uh, which is uh, an exuberant book in May. But today's book uh, is about habituation, and that's very connected with boredom. I didn't see that until you said it, that the surprise signal is what activates the mind and people need that. Um, and people who want something from others need to produce that. And so the uh, boredom problem, let's call it, uh, is closely connected with the fact that people often fall certain stages in their life into a uh, kind of a, a, a rut, a very bad rut, even though their life is very good. And there are things to do to uh, resparkle that don't involve, let's say, political rage. And I think what you're saying, I hadn't thought of any of this, is uh, a set of responses, let's say, to the problem of boredom that aren't, uh, you know, join some uh, extreme political movement or start thinking something thinking I'm thinking is conspiracy theorizing mm-hmm. is sometimes a response to uh boredom probably the answer is yes that it's related no I think it has to be I mean it's, it's related to other things too right it's also this sort of flattening of experience where you're getting everything through screens and on the screen with CGI, AI, Photoshop, all these kinds of things, the universe is of limitless possibility. And the problem is, is that when you turn to the news, <laughs> things aren't Photoshopped, things aren't, um, you know, uh, CGI, but your brain can now, uh, the permission structure to imagine all sorts of scenarios beyond the realistic just gets easier and easier to embrace. and. I think that's another problem with social media, which is this flattening of distinctions that you get. I must say that, um, you know, I've had government roles of various sorts, and I sometimes see things about myself on social media and things I've done that are astounding. Yeah. The, the people who say them, I have no reason to think that they're crazy or stupid. They're, they're I, I assure you, wrong. Mm-hmm. And, uh, bizarrely wrong. And how do they come to think that? Yeah, no, it's, it's the, my standard response to a lot of people is, look, I'm not an expert on a lot of things. You actually are an expert on quite a few things. But the one thing I am a better expert than anybody in the world, with the possible exception of my wife, but I don't, I don't even think even her, is my own motivations. 
<laughs> and these people who lecture me about why I did something or why I said something, it's, it's this immediate window into their fantasy world about how the world really operates and has no relation to what my own motivations are. And I'm sure you get the same thing about how you're secretly a Maoist and that's why you're doing what you're doing, you know, that kind of thing. You're quite right that the, that the uh, uh, lively, that's too weak a word, but the uh, infinite possibility nature of the screen is mapped on to the more mundane act actuality of reality, though reality has a lot more possibilities than we might have expected. And, and it leads to thoughts that are uh, ill-connected to what's real. Yeah, I, and I should be clear, because in, in, you're one of the authors, um, John and Heights, another, you know, uh, Paul Bloom is another, but, um, I've come around to thinking that psychology has more merit to it than I used to. I used to dismiss a lot of it. Um, uh, and so when I say I'm an expert on my motivations, that doesn't mean I have perfect knowledge about my motivations. I can be very wrong about some of my motivations, but I know when other people are even more wrong, right? I mean, like they're, they're, the midlife crisis stuff is real. I started, a you know, I co-launched co this, this startup, The Dispatch, in midlife and I thought I was doing it for all these high-minded reasons and all this kind of stuff, but like the desire for to re-sparkle is clearly part of it. And I may not acknowledge it as much in my head as some of these other things, but it's it's part of it, that kind of thing. It's just that there are people who have narratives in their head and they want to fit you into it. And the narratives are ridiculous. And it's you can you can still have imperfect knowledge of yourself and recognize the ridiculousness of ridiculousness of other people's narratives. I mean, what you're saying about boredom, there is a connection with habituation. I'll say I gave a talk once to a group on conspiracy theories, and the group consisted of maybe 60% just people who are interested and 40% people who accepted conspiracy theories and thought that I was a demon for describing why people believe false conspiracy theories. And, well, and they were full of life. They were a little... <laughs> Frightening, but they yeah. weren't bored. Gosh, yeah, yeah. them to talk nine eleven, their eyes were gleaming. Yeah, I mean, there's this concept, main character syndrome, where people put themselves as the central character in the movie that they're in, and it's very closely related to conspiracy theory stuff because it's this, you know, there's a way to elevate your own sense of self worth if you think you are the central character. Calling, speaking truth to power about some vast conspiracy. If it turns out you're just some crank who spends too much time in a used bookshop and no one's paying attention to you, that's, that's a source of despair. But if at, around every corner, the CIA is trying to get you, that's an exciting life. Yeah. And it, you, I mean, habituation is, there. there's more going on, but it's related because if you're seeing surprise signals everywhere, uh, the world is full of colors. And sometimes seeing gray everywhere is what people like least. So I want to get to frogs in a second, but um, the boredom thing, you know, so Francis Fukuyama, who I'm a defender of the end of history book, he makes this point at the end of the book, I quoted it in the piece I wrote about boredom. He makes this point that he was thinking centuries from now, alas, it was at most decades, um, but uh, that if we all reach Denmark in effect, right, if we all reach to some prosperous social democracy, liberal democratic capitalist, you know, some version of that at the end of history, war is essentially go on, gone, uh, bourgeois values, which is my nirvana, reign supreme. Um, he said, you know, he, he says, the history shows that boredom um, causes people to uh, want to leap out of the tedium at the end of history. And uh, there's talk about, you know, there, there, there are historians of ancient Rome who talk about how the prosperity and peace and prosperity that that Romans enjoyed, maybe not their victims, but they enjoyed, led them to be more adventurous abroad because they were looking to fill up the sense of meaning and belonging. Um, World War I wouldn't have happened but for the utter complacency of a whole generation of European powers who thought, well, it'll be fun. It'll be adventure like what our grandparents did. It'll be six months and we'll be home in time for Christmas um, because there's this, you know, desire to, 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 to 
be historic, to be great and that kind of thing. And um, I know that a lot of the book is about how to fight off habituation in your own life. And I think that's really valuable. And that's why people should get the book. Um, but what concerns me in the, you know, you have this chapter at the end about fascism um, is the wholesale problem of habituation, the taking things for granted, right? Taking things for granted is the syn synonym for ungrateful, um, where you, you, you pocket all the successes of air conditioning and long lives and not dying from a terrible disease, but you want something more. And that's that quest for greatness and meaning takes democracies in a really bad direction. Okay, so there are two things. Uh, how did Hitler succeed, so to speak? And contemporaneous accounts, some of which are really searing uh, by people who were killed, are that it really happened step by step. It was much more incremental than we think, that Hitler wasn't history's Hitler in his first months or even his first year. Um, and people there said it was like being in a field where things were growing and they were getting bigger and bigger, and suddenly it was too late and everything was over your head. And that's often how democracy collapses, not uh, immediately, not with a bang, and not really with a whimper either, with um, uh, the gradual habituation of the people. That's the line that one of the Germans gave, the gradual habituation of the people. And there are things happening in Europe and North America right now that are, uh, I'm not sure what the right word, but is, uh, that are concerning about habituation of the people to things that are not consistent with our best traditions, let's say. But this, what, do you have a remedy? Yeah, um, th there are people uh, uh, we call dishabituation entrepreneurs, who are people who are uh, alerting uh, others to the existence of, you are one, if I may say, <laughs> uh, to the existence of threats. And they can be you know, you know, threats from the left, threats from the right, can be threats from some place that doesn't have an identifiable left-right quality to it. And we have, I think, all of those in our country. And uh, the what people said about Germany at the time and after is what's, what's for, it's as if history is made by the leaders and the, the people who succeeded and the people who failed. It's not right. It's a, a zillion decisions by people who never make it in the history books. That, that's what history comes from. And, you know, each of us is in one or another respect, one of those zillions. And we can, you know, do something small or large or eat our meals and pat our dogs. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I quote it too much, but and I always get it slightly off, but getting to this idea about just don't lie. You know, um, there's a wonderful line from Alexander Solzhenitsyn, who was certainly a disequilibrium entrepreneur, uh, who says, you can resolve to live your life with integrity. Let your credo be this. Um, let the lie come into the world. Let it even triumph, but not through me. Right. And it is amazing to me how so many problems in the political sphere, in the moral sphere, get solved if people tell the truth. Um, not everything. And people can disagree about what the truth is. But if they resolve to try to figure out what the truth is and tell it, it is a massive check on a lot of the problems that you're, that you're talking about. And anyway, uh, I know we're running long. I wanted to make two, make one point and, and ask one other question I should have asked up front. Um, the one point is on habituation. I think one of the best examples of the resparkling thing and the habituation problem is I'm sure you had this experience where you've been in your own home, but your dogs aren't. And at first you're like, oh, this is such a relief. I don't have to do this. I don't have to take them out for a walk. I don't have to feed them. And within a very short period of time, all of a sudden your house feels unreally, I mean, just unbelievably empty, like disenchantedly empty and, and isolated. And I think that that's one of these things is you, 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 when your dogs are around, often the hassles present themselves first and foremost. But when your dogs aren't around, 
man, does it feel lonely. Completely, completely. My dogs were gone because all of us were away and the dogs that took them and the dogs that took them in a period. So when we we're back, there were no dogs. And when they came back, I was so dishabituated yeah. that they were a little puzzled why I was <laughs> they were very excited to see me, but my excitement was off the charts. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's that feeling of coming, walking into your house and your dogs aren't there to greet you is not a great feeling. Um, okay. So the last thing, which, you know, normally when in, I live in Washington, when a book comes out, the first thing you're supposed to do is look in the index for your own name. I didn't have any anticipation of being mentioned in this book, so I didn't do that. But I did, because the topic is habituation, look up the frog experiment. And one of my peeves, not as great as distinguishing between less and fewer, um, and trying to keep the term decimation alive. But one of my great peeves is the boiling frog analogy, which is just not true. But, um, but you did a very deep dive in this. And so why don't you just sort of explain what we should and shouldn't, what the facts are and what we should take from it. And then I'll, I'll let, you, let you go. There was an experiment in which the frog appeared not to jump out of the slowly boiling water. So it became a thing. But there was an effort to replicate the experiment, and the frogs did jump out of the boiling water. And the consensus seems to be that frogs will, in fact, jump out of boiling water. So what's cool... Before it gets boiling, right? I mean, they, when it gets just slightly warm, they tend to get out. Yeah. So, so, so that the idea that they're going to stay there until it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and they're dead, that's not true. If it boils slowly, a bit... Uh, uh, they will habituate in the sense that they will not be as sensitive to it as they would have been if, if it had gotten hot all at once. But they're noticing it's getting hot mm -hmm. or they're in, in big trouble, they're going to jump out. So the fact that it went viral, our minds, that this is a, a version of the illusory truth effect. So the fact that people believe the boiling frog uh, falsehood is the illusory truth effect in action. But so, but yet something in there about part of the experiment is they removed the brain from one of these frogs, um, which... Mm -hmm. Which kind of confounded the experiment. It, it, I it, would think so. <laughs> the, the experiments that seem to show that the frog will habituate to boiling water such that it won't notice, there's one reason that's gone viral and we've habituated to it is that it reflects a deeper truth Mm -hmm. uh, people do habituate. You know, you go to some place that's hot and you're going to be miserable the first hour, maybe three hours, and you'll get used to it. But the, the, we need another tale. And the lying tale we discuss, that is a true tale. Right. People habituate to their own lying. You make the clients. Okay, Cass Sunstein, thank you so much for doing this. This has been great. Um, I hope I'll have you back. Um, at some point, we'll have to do another dog episode because that's just who we are. Um, and the book is look again, and I'll do the full plug again and in, in my clothes, but, uh, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. Great pleasure. Great to see you. Okay. So professor Sunstein has left the studio. Um, and I get a kick out of this stuff. I, I think it's really interesting. Um, you know, I've been making this point a couple different places lately about how, you know, like neoconservatism rightly understood is a rediscovery of, uh, through the, through social science of sort of some pretty basic rules and understandings about how life should work and how life does work and therefore how it should work. And I do think there's a case to be made that the, I don't know if you'd call it a revolution, but like this sort of explosion of, of social psychology stuff in the last 15 years with Jonathan Haidt and uh, Paul Bloom and, and the stuff that Cass has done sort of does a similar thing uh, via psychology, right? I mean, that, it turns out that like, you know, a thousand generations of, of mothers paying attention to their kids accumulated some insights about kids and humans, um, that doesn't have any of the social science or psycho psychological or scientific lingo attached to it, but still illuminates and points to and depends upon some fundamental insights about human nature. And this habituation stuff, I think, is really interesting. And again, I, 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 I highly recommend the book. There's a lot of, you know, interesting sort of news you can use kind of. Uh, um, it's, it's, it's not cheap and tawdry like a lot of self-help books, but it's, it's, um, uh, 
full of sort of really interesting insights about um, how our brains work. And I think that, you know, being on guard for this idea of, of sort of the numbness that comes with just getting used to good things to the point where you don't even realize they're good or care that they're good anymore, a really important thing to keep in mind for individuals, but also for society. I mean, in, in, in a weird way, and I, I know I hinted at it a few times and all but shouted it once or twice, a lot of this stuff is is sort of at the heart of my argument in in Suicide of the West. Um, um, we are turning our back through ingratitude, um, but also motivated by, in large part, boredom um, from the most, some of the most staggering accomplishments in human history. And just because we get used to them doesn't mean they're not worth saving and protecting. I mean, sort of like, you know, remember the movie uh, WALL-E um, with a little robot and all the fat humans um, who are, you know, in, I guess, in suspended animation for a while? You know, they're on a spaceship going, you know, traversing the stars. That's super cool. Just because they got used to it doesn't mean it's not super cool. Um, but they did. They got habituated to it and they got lazy and they got fat. And, um, you know, and I, I think one could go too far using Wally as a metaphor for all of our problems, but it, it, it gets a, at a real truth. Um, you know, varieties of spice of life mix things up, um, but not in a way that you know, leads you to turn your back on your fundamental commitments, those you love, those who rely on you or anything like that but mix things up in a way that allows you to appreciate those people and those institutions in your life with fresh eyes. And um, I hate the phrase re-sparkling. I, I hate it with a great passion, but the idea behind it, I, I think, is a really important one. And it had never really occurred to me until this conversation about how Yuval Harari, um, whose name I'm probably butchering, was both right and wrong about, you know, about, this idea that vacation um, or travel is rejuvenating um, because we all, the way we talk about it and the way it's sold, like you would not make a lot of money selling vacations saying, and when you get home, you'll really appreciate what you have at home, right? You have to say, oh, at Sandals, all the drinks are free. And, um, you know, the, these, these, these young women who wouldn't look at you one way or the other in, your daily life, they will find you very attractive. Um, if you come down to this, you know, dumb resort, uh, that's how they have to sell their products. But the truth of it is, you can do a lot of great things on vacations, and you can learn a lot of stuff on vacations. But one of the really great things about vacations is coming home and lets you appreciate um, what you have. And I kind of wish sort of my project in life is to convince people to come home from the craziness that we're going through right now and appreciate what they actually have and what a good country this is and um, um, and stop with all the crazy talk. But that's a topic we'll obviously have to return to another time. Send your questions in to uh, the remnant at the dispatch.com or uh, remnant at the dispatch.com for if you have questions for the AMA. And um, I'll see you next time. No, you won't. This is a podcast.